Okay, this lecture we're going to focus on the second part of the origins of organized crime. Uh, specifically, we're going to focus on key figures in Chicago and New York. And one thing to keep in mind with all of these figures is if there's any other information you want to know about the individuals, because we have so many to cover, we're going to be going through them fairly quickly. Um, but there's books, there's plenty of books on every single one of these figures. So if you're more interested in it, please uh, feel free to um, go to the library or you know go to Amazon and find some of these other books because there's tons of information on them, but we can only focus on the highlights for uh, time purposes. But by the end of this lecture, you're going to be able to understand the roots of organized crime in major northern cities such as New York and Chicago, and you're also going to become familiar with key figures in the development of organized crime in major northern cities. So just as a recap from last, um, last lecture, um, this important role of ethnicity in the development of organized crime in these large cities needs to be uh, underscored. So due to reasons described in the prior lectures, with this mass exodus of mafiosis in various provinces of Italy, uh, many of these individuals that engaged in organized crime in uh, parts of Italy actually fled to northern cities, with New York and Chicago being the main ones, and New York really over that one. Um, so again, just as a recap from last uh, lecture, massive amounts of individuals spread to the United States, and some of these came from Italy, some came from other countries, and at this time, the country was really ripe for organized crime activities to take place. So we got to think about these major historical events that were going on at this time around the turn of the 1900s and especially until about 1935. So if you look at it, we had Prohibition. We also had the Great Depression. We had World War I. And this led to a lot of disruptions in uh, not only just the, the moral fabric of the country, but also for um, our culture and ethnicity as a whole and our identity as a country. Again, we're still trying to stake our claim. The United States is still trying to form their own unique identity. And add this to a huge urban population um, coming from other countries, it's going to further disrupt things. And I've got a little exercise. Go to this uh, census map display here. I already have uh, this thing loaded up. Um, and although this is between a different time frame, it's right up to the cusp of it. And you can see how big of a change um, in our urban population that we actually had. So if you look at this map, again, this is between 1790 and 1890. Every yellow dot represents a city of between 5,000 people and 99,999. So right at 100,000. And if you look at the red dot, it's a city of 100,000 or more. So in 1790, look how many yellow dots there were. There weren't many. And definitely there were not any red dots. But now as it hit play on this exercise, and this is going further and further up until 1890, and it shows the huge effect of the urban populations that started forming that we didn't have prior. And a lot of these were from individuals from Italy coming to the United States. So again, you see the massive amount of change that took place in a fairly short period of time, especially in the northeastern area of the United States. And this had a huge impact on our country as a whole, and especially these big cities, because now we have a development of big cities, whereas beforehand we did not have this. Um, we also had a lot of Irish and Italians settling in Philadelphia, and they would operate with a lot of Jewish leadership, uh, we had Cleveland had a lot of Italians and Irish as well. So did New Jersey, so did Kansas City, and so did New York. Um, and we're going to go through some of these throughout the, the next lecture, but primarily we're going to focus on New York and Chicago. And one thing to keep in mind with this as well is we're not really going to go into order. We're going to uh, be skipping around as far as uh, linear-wise with the years. We're just going to hit on the main concepts, and the textbook's going to help you draw all that together and how it happened in what order of events uh, because it's kind of tough to talk about all these different individuals since they're all um, existed primarily during the same time frame. 
But first, we're going to talk about Chicago. And the creation of the Chicago mob was partly due to politics um, and the prohibition becoming intertwined with one another. And this led to a lot of corruption, but this was essential for conducting business, both with politics and with organized crime members. And in Chicago, during the 1930s, especially 1920s and 1930s, corruption uh, was at one of its all-time highs, and Chicago was the primary place that this occurred. The first person we're going to talk about is Al Capone, and he lived between 1899 and 1947. But he was born originally in Brooklyn, New York, and he had joined a gang when he was a teenager called the Five Pointers. And he was originally recruited by a guy named uh, Frankie Yale, and he put um, Al Capone to work as a bartender. However, after a year or two of doing this, uh, Al Capone was suspected of killing a member of the rival gang by a guy named Wild Bill Lovett. Um, and to get him out of the mess that was forming, they actually uh, came up with the idea to send him to Chicago. So he eventually was moved to Chicago because of this fear that he was going to get killed or seriously hurt for being suspected of killing the person. And odds are he probably did kill the person. Uh, but that's beside the point. Um, so he eventually did move to Chicago, and he um, had a mentor named Johnny Torrio. And this mentor, uh, in about 1920, brought Capone to Chicago to work with a guy named Big Jim Colisimo. And he focused purely on prostitution, and he pretty much ignored prohibition. So he ignored all the money-making ventures that prohibition could bring somebody. Uh, so Calismo eventually, people got tired of this because, again, it's like somebody investing in a typewriter when you've got all the computers booming around you. Uh, so Calismo was actually shot to death, um, primarily from his refusal to change his business venture because there's a lot of money involved, and Torrio actually took over. And between Torrio and Capone, they actually took over most of the territories in Chicago, and it became so profitable uh, with bootlegging, that they actually started splitting about $100,000 in cash per week by 1924. And this was after expenses. So again, there's a huge, huge amount of money that could be made in this. Um, Capone eventually became involved in public works, uh, and this is primarily to get the public on your side, so to get them in good favor. Uh, one thing, there's, a, there's several pictures that you can look up, but where Al Capone uh, during the Great Depression, was paying for meals for thousands of people to eat. And people remember that stuff, and they're less likely to tell on you, especially with the police, if you're the one putting foods in, food in their mouth and it's not the government. Um, Capone also, at this time, got his, he called it his puppet mayor, um, elected in Cicero. So that, again, shows the wide uh, depth that he had and the wide influence that he had in Chicago. And this led to even more control. So again, he had even more power and control. And he gradually took over just about all organized crime ventures in Chicago. But then came the notable event, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929. And at this time, Capone again started getting paranoid and he wanted to get rid of some of the competition that started emerging. And he killed a guy named Wise, um, Albert Wise, and he was the leader of the Irish game. Um, he also went after a new leader named Charles Bugs Moran. Um, and he had gotten several of his uh, gang members to act as police officers. And they eventually killed seven members, all of Moran's group. And these are two pictures from the crime scene um, at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Um, and again... Capone is the one that orchestrated this whole deal. He wasn't directly involved as far as the one there that murdered them, but he was the one that got his two or three people to actually do that. And you can tell the gravity of this event. You know, we still talk about the St. Valentine's Day Massacre today, but we've had several school shootings and several shootings in public um, that greatly outweigh the gravity of this. And two, those individuals weren't innocent people. They were those that are, were involved in organized crime. But at the time, you can tell this was a huge shock. This was a huge shock to the public. And this started getting the attention of not only law enforcement, but some of the members of the public to call more attention to it. Um, Capone actually eventually killed uh, the two assassins that were 
in charge of the St. Valentine's Day massacre himself, um, so they did not get away scot-free. We also have a group called the Untouchables, and I'm sure many of you have heard of them. Um, they were the the um, source of the movie that was done in the late 1980s with Kevin Costner and um, Sean Connery, and it had several others in there as well. But the Treasury Department started looking into organized crime, and they appointed a guy named Elliot Ness. Um, and they appointed him to the Chicago Police Department after President Herbert Hoover actually visited Chicago, and he saw how big of an issue organized crime actually was. Um, and they, the Untouchables, persistently went after Capone and gang members. Um, and they actually came up with the idea to prosecute Al Capone for tax evasion. And he was actually able to convict Capone, and he was sentenced to 11 years in prison, and he got a fine of about $80,000. Um, and Capone eventually, um, after he was released from prison, he eventually died from syphilis in 1947. Um, so this was one successful way and started a trend of prosecuting these head figures of organized crime for uh, crimes such as tax evasion. Uh, which one thing that's somewhat ironic about Elliot Ness is that he um, he you know was at this time appointed to fight prohibition things uh, of bootlegging and things like that during the prohibition, and he eventually. Um, developed an alcohol issue himself, and he ha also had a failed political career. Um, he ended up dying, I believe, in the 1950s or 1960s from a heart attack in, uh, I think it was in Cleveland. But um, one thing that's kind of ironic that, you know, he's seen as the face of this group that went after those that were making alcohol and distributing it illegally, and he ended up uh, dying or having a bad alcohol addiction himself. Uh, one one thing again with the Untouchables, um, a lot of people criticize their actual influence and they question their actual influence uh, because there's a lot of doubt regarding how uh, big of an impact they actually had at that time. And there's a lot of uh, scholars that argue that the Untouchables were more of a myth and a urban legend than anything. Um, they did exist, but their role was somewhat glorified especially once you take into account the development of movies like Kevin Costner, uh, the films that he was in, um, it started, um, again, forming identity of its own. Another important Chicago mob figure that you need to know is Sam Giancana, and he lived from 1908 to 1975, and he was a member of the group called The Outfit, and he was a part-time wheelman and a chauffeur for Capone at one point. Um, he had claimed to be arrested about over 70 times, and he met a uh, fellow Chicago gangs gangster named Edward Teenan Jones in prison. And after prison, he got the idea from Teenan Jones to become more involved with rackets. And he was actually, after this point, able to move pretty quickly through the ranks because of the old Prohibition-era mob bosses started aging and retiring once he started coming into fruition. Um, he eventually, uh, one odd piece of information, he was actually hired by the CIA to assassinate Fidel Castro at some point, uh, but there was a failed attempt with that. Um, he later spent a year in prison for not cooperating with the government about organized crime involvement, um, and he later went on to another hearing, and he was drugged through the media quite a bit, but in 1975 he was actually assassinated um, in his house, and nobody really knows uh, what happened to him, uh, like who who was responsible for killing him. Uh, there is some talk that the government was actually behind that. Um, his daughter, I remember seeing her on an interview, and she actually was saying that, you know, Sam Giancana, her father, was not involved in anything with organized crime, uh, which is, I'm sure, you know, she's wearing the, the rose-tinted glasses, uh, especially when she views her father, but he definitely was involved, but the question uh, is how uh, how and to what extent, and also uh, what role the government played in his death remains to be seen. One thing we also need to talk about is the Castle Marie's War, and on September 10th, 1931, there's a guy named Salvatore Mar Maranzano, again, Salvatore Maranzano, and he was the 
referred to as the boss of bosses in the United States. And he actually was assassinated on September 10th, 1931. And this led to approximately 40 Sicilian leaders being killed within two days after Maranzano's assassination. And a lot of people view this as an effort by American, uh, Americanized mob leaders. So they were the new kids in the block. And they were essentially performing a genocide or some type of ethnic cleanse against their old Sicilian roots. Um, and this was led by Luciano, Meyer Lansky, and Bugsy Siegel. And we're going to talk about each one of these later on in the lecture. Um, but a lot of people would argue that this is also a legend that is not necessarily supported by historical evidence. Um, there's been a few studies and they've gone through a lot of the newspaper clippings at, at that time and they can't find any any case of 40-something people being killed uh, within a short time frame, especially within two days, uh, let alone if they were Sicilian leaders. So this is a questionable um, questionable event that a lot of people, again, attribute to urban legend. But this began after an individual named Maranzano, um, he began uh, hijacking uh, truckloads of Mazariah's liquor, and there's a guy named Mazariah as well. So Luciano was angry at this, and he's especially angry at the management style of Mazariah. And he tried to get in with Maranzano by killing Mazariah, but he eventually suspected that those two were actually working together to set him up. And he had refused Maranzano's offer of being second in command and paying him all the profits. And uh, Luciano was eventually beaten by an angry Maranzano um, and a couple of his men. Um, and Luciano actually passed out from this beating, and they actually dumped him on the street because they thought he was dead. And this is where he actually earned his name Lucky, and he became known as Lucky Charlie or Lucky Luciano, and that's probably where you've heard his name. Um, but Luciano eventually killed both Maranzano and Mazariah, and Mazariah was the one that was shot first, and he was killed while he was playing his cards. Uh, but Maranzano eventually was took, he took over the operations, and he eventually was shot five months later while he was in an office building. So now we get into Lucky Luciano. And he was a popular... Uh, he lived between 1980, or 1897 and 1962. And he was a popular boss throughout all of New York. Especially among the Italian-American organized crime members. Uh, and he knew the importance of maintaining relationships with other ethnic groups that were involved in organized crime, and primarily with Jewish leaders. He knew that it was crucial to maintain these ties with other ethnic groups, and again, primarily Jewish leaders. Um, the biggest characteristic of his rule uh, was that there was no one central ruler, but it was more of a series of negotiations with all major decisions. So again, he's not really painting a target on his back. It's more spread out. And at this time, Prohibition ended in 1934, so Luciano got his organized crime groups um, involved in some other ventures. Uh, one of these was casino gambling. He also got them involved in the numbers racket, construction, uh, waterfront trucking, which is where all the ports are, um, also taxi businesses. Um, he even got them involved in bookmaking, bail bonds, bars, drugs, nightclubs, and restaurants. So again, there's enormous depth and breadth of these activities. They were not primarily involved in production and distribution of alcohol anymore. Prohibition was over. But this, again, shows the highly adaptive nature of organized crime. Um, and actually today, the Luciano Group is still involved in protection, hijacking, burglary, warehouses, and robberies. Um, but with Lucky Luciano, brothels were another key piece of his business and key source of income. And he had about a thousand prostitutes total with 200 madams in charge. And a madam is simply, think of it as a pimp. It's a female pimp. They're in charge of the 1,000 prostitutes. Um, but this actually proved to be his downfall because he would oftentimes spend plenty of time around the prostitutes. Um, and he started discussing a lot of the details of his business. And he also was treating his prostitutes pretty poorly. Um, and many of them, as I mentioned in one of the first few lectures of this course, uh, they actually turned as witnesses against him in trial. He also, at this time, began becoming showy in public. So he started showing a lot of uh, 
nice suits that he was wearing, nice cars, and he started drawing the attention of both concerned citizens and law enforcement. And one person in particular he drew the attention of was a guy named Thomas Dewey that we've already talked about later uh, earlier in the semester. And he had been appointed a special prosecutor um, at this time, and he began going after Luciano and some others. Um, and Luciano actually killed Dutch, Sol uh, Dutch, Dutch Schultz in 1935 because of his push for killing Thomas Dewey. And that's something else I've already mentioned. But Dewey actually pursued Lucky Luciano further, and he ended up pr uh, prosecuting him for his massive prostitution operation. Um, and he eventually was sentenced to between 30 and 50 years in prison, but he still allegedly made orders from the inside of prison, so really prison didn't do him that good of, um, that good of um, a, a deal for society by locking him up. He eventually was released, and he was deported to Sicily. So now, with Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, we have to look at the New York-Las Vegas connection. So at this time, Bugsy Siegel, and we're going to get into this in just a second, was the one that was primarily responsible for um, having New York organized crime transfer to the Las Vegas area. But Bugsy Siegel, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, lived between 1906 and 1947. And he was a very important figure in New York City mob history. And he partnered with a guy named Meyer Lansky. And he also partnered with Lucky Luciano, who we just talked about. But he was childhood friends with Meyer Lansky. And he earned the nickname from a judge, uh, the, the nickname of Bugsy from a judge, because um, Siegel acted, um, acted kind of crazy in, uh, in the, his presence. And the judge said, you boys must have bugs in your head go home and stay away from this court. So ever since then, Siegel was known as Bugsy, and Lancey became known as Bug. Uh, so again, that is just an interesting tidbit of how they actually learned their names. Uh, but the funny thing with this is Siegel actually hated his nickname, and this became a huge source of contention, and nobody would dare call that to his face. And I was laughing the other day, I was watching um, you know, the, new, the new show called Mob City that's on TNT, um, and it was pretty funny because there, Bugsy Siegel's in the show, and on the clip for the, for the new episode, um, this guy called him Bugsy to his face, and you know, like it was just a regular nickname, and I kind of laughed and told my wife that you know, nobody would have done that because he would have been murdered right after that, and she just kind of rolled her eyes at me of why I knew that, but I thought it was an interesting story. And again, it kind of shows you too how a lot of times in these movies and TV shows, they get it wrong. But again, he eventually moved to Hollywood. And while he was in Hollywood, he killed a man named Hank Greenberg in 1939. Um, and he used this as a chance to establish his authority in Hollywood. He eventually was arrested for Greenberg's murder in 1940, but he eventually colluded with a district attorney and he spent a lot of money in both L.A. and in New York, he eventually had these charges dropped against him. Uh, but he pretty much worn out his welcome in L.A., um, he, and he was ostracized from the social circles, social circles. And he eventually began building luxury hotels and a lot of gambling resorts in the desert. And he eventually was the one that built his dream casino called the Flamingo. And many of you have probably heard of the Flamingo, uh, but he was the one responsible for building this. But he needed about $1 million to actually build it. So he had to get this money from somewhere, and he got it from a lot of mob bosses in New York City. Um, a lot of contractors eventually took advantage of him, and the price started escalating. Um, and then Siegel really started getting pretty outlandish once... Uh, the Flamingo was already built. He already had some character issues and had worn out his welcome in both New York and in L.A., um, and it got even more so when he was basically the king of Las Vegas at this time. Um, and he also was a very poor manager of this expensive project, and it really pissed off the mob bosses in New York that had loaned him the, mo the money. And they really started seeing him at this point as a liability. And as you could guess it, he was approved for assassination, and uh, he was eventually assassinated in June of 1947. 
But this is crucial, though, because casinos and organized crime groups became interconnected from this point on until about 1970, and some would really debate that it still goes on today. However, with the uh, Nevada uh, Gambling Commission and a few other uh, regulating agencies, a lot of the stuff has been eliminated. But even up until the 1980s and 1990s, we've had major issues with this. Another thing we can talk about is called the Black Hand. And this was an extortion racket that took advantage of Italian Americans. Um, and they never really were formally connected to organized crime. Uh, but they can be traced back to Italy and Sicily since about 1750. Uh, so they have a long storied history. But they used threats of violence and actual violence to extort money from people. Uh, but between 1890 and 1910, this was the heyday for the Black Hand. And there were numerous Italian immigrants coming to the United States. And we've, again, discussed this. Um, to an extent in the earlier part of this lecture and especially the last one. Um, and there was a guy named Ig Ignazio Saeta, and he uh, was also known as Lupo the Wolf, and he was the primary black hander. And he was known for cutting up dead bodies, and he would eventually send them to his farm to either burn or bury. But he took advantage of a lot of Italian Americans for about 30 years. He eventually was arrested for counterfeiting, and he was sentenced to prison for 30 years as well. But the key thing about the Black Hand is they were prominent, they also had, were involved in prominent criminal activities in both Kansas City and in Chicago, and they had a huge impact throughout many cities throughout the U.S. So again, be sure you know the Black Hand. We also have another group called Union Siciliana, and this was in the 1880s fraternal organization to promote social activities and life insurance for Sicilian immigrants in New York City. And their influence grew, and especially as their member base grew, uh, they became really strong numerically, and they were strong enough to actually sway and have a huge impact on local elections, which increased their, um, their picture on the radar for a lot of local politicians. So they were actually able to spread their influence into other major cities, so outside of New York City during this time. Um, and they eventually became a criminal group by this guy named Ignazio Saeti that we talked about a second ago after World War II. But they used their powers to make rackets and prostitution, also an extortion, kidnapping, and murder for hire. Um, they al allegedly hung individuals, especially Saeti, uh, he hung individuals on meat hooks in his office. There's also rumors that he burned people alive. Um, he eventually was set, the lone wolf was sent to prison in 1918, and a guy named Frankie Yell eventually took over. Uh, then Al Capone, Al Capone uh, then had Saeti murdered in 1928. So again, you can see how a lot of this ties together, and a lot of these figures keep popping up. Um, Al Capone, one interesting note, he eventually tried to take over uh, the Union Siciliana, but he was viewed as an outsider since he was in Chicago and since his family's ethnicity was Neo uh, Neapolitan and not Sicilian, uh, which is pretty interesting again because they formed, a lot of these groups formed out of being prosecuted and persecuted uh, for their ethnic issues, um, and now they're doing the same thing. Um, but Capone's friend, Mike Merlo, eventually took over, uh, but he died in about 1924. And right after this period, they had about five different presidents within just a few years' period. Um, and they were uh, eventually all murdered. And again, <laughs> as you can see, I wouldn't want to be the next president because every single person that was took over after that point was eventually murdered. But they eventually, the Union Siciliana faded out uh, once the Great Depression set in. Um, but with this, you don't really need to focus on all the details. Just focus on the main aspect, that it was a fraternal organization, it had a lot of power, and it eventually faded out. Just don't focus on all the details of this. But from now on, be sure you do focus on all the different individuals. The next individual we need to talk about is Arnold, Roth Arnold Rothstein. From 18, he lived from 1882 to 1928. And he was known as The Brain. So his nickname was The Brain. 
and he was the center of a big-time gambling ring for approximately 20 years in New York City. He was also the son of Jewish immigrants in New York. He was extremely good at math, and he was able to fix gambling odds for his own gambling operation. He also owned a lavish casino, and he was a millionaire by 1919, which especially at that time was a huge amount of money. He's also more well-known because he bribed eight players on the Chicago White Sox baseball team to throw the World Series, and this is known as the Black Sox Scandal. This was also the source of the movie Eight Men Out in 1988 that starred uh, John, uh, John Cusack, not Joan, his sister, but John Cusack and Charlie Sheen. Uh, Rothstein actually had to testify, but he convinced the grand jury he was innocent. But his empire continued to grow in the 1920s, um, and this eventually included casinos, brothels, uh, racehorses. He also changed his focus to drug trafficking. Um, but he had so much money he couldn't invest or spend it fast enough, which sounds like a good problem to me. But he started loaning out this money to a lot of politicians, police, judges, prosecutors, and a lot of other important figures in the community that were in debt. And politicians that couldn't repay him would eventually release gangsters in exchange uh, for this payment from prison. He was also able to have judges get rid of warrants and indictments, and a lot of charges were eventually dismissed against him uh, in 1928. But one interesting thing about him is he was never indicted for crimes that he was actually involved in. And he, was, he did so because he was remaining distant, and he really never directly handled a lot of these crimes. He was mainly into the conspiracy aspect. He was the one in charge of it all, and he never directly did any of these crimes himself, which again, this was one of the main influences for why we needed to change our tactics to fight organized crime, and especially the leaders, because they were protected, and a lot of the bottom rung were actually the ones that had to go to prison. Um, but he also employed very well-paid lieutenants to do all of his dirty work. So again, he kept a lot of loyalty because he paid them very well. Um, and he always operated with cash, so there's no record at all. And he usually had a 90% take on all transactions. So again, every single transaction that he had to keep, and since he had a good track record, he was able to keep about 90% of all transactions. He eventually suffered from very serious health issues in about 1928. He started having shaky hands. He started having twitchy eyes. He acted very nervous, and he also had slurred speech. Um, he eventually was playing in a poker game one night, and he refused to pay an individual that was wanting his money back after a poker game, and that guy actually shot him. Um, and although he didn't die, his empire started being divided at this point. Um, and Frank Costello, Frank Erickson, Lepke Burkhalter, and uh, a guy named Legs Diamond eventually took over this, and we're going to discuss each one of these in detail later on. But again, Arnold Rothstein, also known as the Brain, is one of the key figures of organized crime. And he was not, you know, the traditional one that we thought that was very imposing. And a lot of these, you know, he wasn't uh, the big figure like Scarface Al Capone was. Uh, but again, he was a mastermind that revolutionized organized crime at this time. And the last one we're going to talk about for this lecture, lecture is a guy named Dutch Schultz. And he lived between 1902 and 1935. He was originally born, uh, his name was Arthur Flegenheimer, and he, he changed his own name to Dutch Schultz. Uh, but he grew up in the Bronx, and he eventually dropped out of school in the fourth grade. Um, he ended up purchasing a Bronx saloon um, from some uh, robberies, some money that he had earned through some robberies. And he assembled a group of Jewish criminals at this time. He eventually bought some more saloons during Prohibition, uh, and he began supplying a lot of bootleg beer and whiskey at this time as well. But he began spreading his empire throughout other parts of New York City, and he also started killing a lot of rival gang leaders. And you can see his picture, one's a mugshot on the right, and one's where he's a little bit happier stay on the left. But he eventually got into the numbers racket in Harlem, which we'll talk about later on the semester, but essentially it's an informal lottery. But he combined the promise of protection and profit profitability 
with the implied threat of a gang war. And that's how he was able to stake his claim. Again, he's able to combine this promise of protection and profitability, but he also had the implied threat of a gang war. So he was doing so with the threat that he will start trouble if he needs to. He eventually became a millionaire by 1930. And again, at this time, that's a lot of money now, is especially a lot of money then. Um, but he primarily became a millionaire from uh, bootlegging and from the numbers game. He also got into the slot machines game in New York. But primarily how he did this was through violence. And earlier I mentioned a guy named Leg Diamond. And this guy named Leg Diamond in 1930 was an employee of Schultz. And at one point, he began hijacking beer trucks that were actually owned by Schultz to make more money. Uh, Diamond was eventually murdered by Schultz. Um, but Schultz was later involved in a shooting with two New York detectives, uh, but he got off because of um, all these different mob bosses uh, that had the power in the area. Um, he also faced a lot of legal problems as well. He was charged by Thomas Dewey. Again, that name pops up again, but he was charged by Thomas Dewey for tax evasion. Um, and he attempted to convince citizens because then he argued that we need to have the trial moved, and they actually moved it to an upstate New York courtroom. So he and his wife actually moved up there and became very active in the community. And they actually tried convincing these citizens that he was a good guy. He would never do any of this stuff. And it paid off because he was found not guilty. Um, and his operations, though, at this time were eventually taken over uh, by Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, and Madden. Um, and he eventually moved his operations to Newark, New Jersey. Uh, but Schultz really at this time became a very big source of contention for other organized crime members because of the attention he attracted from other mob bosses. Again, he's painting a big target on his back and bringing more attention from law enforcement, especially Thomas Dewey, who they all feared at that time. And they knew that if he continued this behavior, he was going to be the downfall of them. So they wanted some way of controlling this. So Schultz actually decided he was going to murder Thomas Dewey. Um, and again, at this point, he was a huge mob buster. Um, other mob members knew that this, again, would be the demise of their gangs. So they decided that Schultz had to go. He had to go. So they decided to kill him. And he was eating at a place called the Palace Chop House in Newark, New Jersey, uh, while he was discussing the details of how Dewey was going to be killed, and he was shot. Um, he didn't die initially, but he eventually died later on that night. So you can probably start seeing a theme now. A lot of these mob bosses didn't live very long. I mean, Dutch Schultz between 1902 and 1935, so what was he, about 33 years old. That's not very old. Um, a lot of these guys, Arnold Rothstein was really about the only exception with this. And once they become on top, they eventually have a target painted on their back, and they don't last very long. The next lecture, we're also going to focus on a lot of key members. Uh, specifically, we're going to focus on um, New York figures, New York City figures, such as Frank Costello, Frank Erickson, Vito Genovese, Joseph Bonanno, Joseph Colombo, Carlo Gambino, Paul Castellano, and John Gotti.